staff, this, this issue comes up on the wards every day, comes up in the clinic every day, the selection of what stress test for which patient. And um, it, it can often lead to some good teaching points. The point I usually make to the house staff is you choose, choose the test based on the question you're trying to answer. And so I hope our esteemed speakers today will address that and that hopefully at the end we'll have time for, for discussion. Uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Michael McDaniel. Mike is the uh, director of the cardio, cardiac cath lab at Grady. So Mike is going to discuss exercise treadmill testing as he's, he will see that he sees the downstream results of the patients who have positive stress tests. Mike, start us off. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Well, thanks so much for being here. So I'm going to try to make the uh, argument that uh, exercise treadmill testing should maybe be the first uh, test of choice for many of our patients. I have no conflicts. This is a, a tough uh, topic, and I think there is some confusion about selecting a stress test. And part of the confusion, I think, lies in the clinicians get confused over what we're actually looking for. Sometimes tests look for atherosclerosis. Other tests look for ischemia. And still other tests look for angina. And the problem is, is you can have one without the other two in certain circumstances. The other thing that I think we jumble up is sometimes making a diagnosis versus making a prognosis. These tests can diagnose atherosclerosis, ischemia, or angina. They can also make a prognosis, meaning more atherosclerosis, more ischemia, more angina, the worse the prognosis. A lot of our testing is focused around detecting atherosclerosis and ischemia, but I would argue that maybe we should spend more time thinking about angina. Now, angina, I think most people would say, well, that's something you get in the history, as part of the history. You don't need a test for it. The problem is, is there's a discordance between what clinicians hear and what patients are saying. This is a nice uh, outpatient study of over uh, 1,200 outpatient visits when they looked at what uh, clinicians uh, thought the, phys the patients were saying about their angina symptoms compared to what the patients were um, truly trying to express in, in, in a Seattle angina questionnaire. And the bottom line is about half the time doctors either over -underestimate, overestimated or underestimated their angina severity. The other thing is, is that even if you look at a Seattle angina questionnaire, a more robust way of looking at angina limitations, what we find is that what the patients are saying on an angina questionnaire doesn't always match up with real life. This is the original uh, study from John Spurtis where they looked at physical limitation scores compared to how they performed on a treadmill, and the R value is 0.42, which means that there is a correlation, but the correlation's really not that great. And so the takeaway from two of these is studies is that what physicians hear is not always what patients say or what they actually mean. And what patients say or actually me mean isn't always reflected in the truth of how they perform. And so we should try to go back to really understand how patients are performing and how they feel. A big question around this topic is does ischemia matter? We're going to hear more about this in slides to come. Certainly we know prognostically ischemia is incredibly important. More ischemia, worse survival. But what we don't know is, is ischemia a modifiable risk? We know that in the COURAGE trial, revascularization for patients with ischemia, a lot of these patients had ischemia and ischemia reductions, but there was not a big improvement in survival compared to optimal medical therapy. And that's led to the ischemia trial, which is currently undergoing. And it's enrolling patients with a lot of ischemia, moderate to severe ischemia, being randomized to either an invasive revascularization strategy or a more conservative strategy. And so a couple years from now, we may come back to this uh, topic and, and, and tell you something different about ischemia. But today, at least our guidelines, there's equipoise about the importance of revascularization for large amounts of ischemia. And so when we say, why do we revascularize most of our non-ACS patients? This is the non-ACS group. It's usually for symptom relief. But the symptoms we hear may not be the symptoms that patients are saying, and it may not reflect the, the actual um, degree of uh, limitation that they actually uh, have. And so I would argue that maybe we need to go back and start looking at detecting and classifying the patient's angina, because that's actually what we're trying to treat. And so the treadmill test is that just that. It's a test of angina. The, di the definition of angina is the substernal chest pain or the equivalent of that's brought on by exertion or emotional stress. 
and it's relieved with rest or nitroglycerin. Inherent in this definition is that this is due to a lack of oxygen delivery to the heart at the time of the stress. And so the treadmill gives us an objective assessment about how the symptoms, how the patient does, about their symptoms and how severe they are. And it can reduce the discordant diagnosis of one doctor who walks into the room and says, this patient definitely has typical angina, and the next doctor that walks into the room and says, oh, this patient has non-cardiac chest pain. And so while we hook the patient up and there's a lot of focus on what goes on in the screen uh, in the EKG, the real important part of a treadmill is what comes out of the patient's mouth. What are the symptoms when they're exercising? What is it like? What's the quality? When does it start? Does it limit their activity? Does it respond to rest? Do you give them a nitroglycerin in recovery and it goes away? How long do they exercise? And so not only does it help us with the diagnosis of angina, but it also can give us a prognosis. We know that there are things on a treadmill that are associated with high risk, meaning exercise-induced VT, VF, exercise-induced ST elevation, ST depressions at low workloads or those that persist into recovery, and those with hypotension, certainly very high risk for early mortality. The other thing that we should probably be doing, and I would argue that if you're not seeing this on your, on your stress tests, you should ask your cardiologist to report this as the Duke Treadmill Score. The Duke Treadmill Score is a score that looks at the exercise time in minutes, minus five times the SDA deviation in millimeters, minus four times the angina index, zero being none, one being non-limiting, and two being limiting. The bottom line is you're looking at how much do you exercise, how much ischemia, and how much angina does the patient have. You convert this into a score, and if you have a low-risk score, you have low annual mortality. If you have a high-risk score, you have high annual mortality, intermediate, somewhere in between. So how do you take away this? What do you take from this? Well, if you have somebody who exercises and doesn't have angina or ischemia, it's hard to make these patients better. And so we probably <clears throat> need to focus on just follow-up and no further um, evaluations. Those that have ischemia and angina, very low levels of activity, you can help these patients with revascularization dramatically. And we should go straight to the cath lab. We don't need to waste time with other stress testing modalities. It's probably this intermediate group that where we need to focus on imaging, where whether a patient has exercise limitations or they have symptoms that may be angina but you don't see ischemia. Or maybe you see ischemia but no angina. And there's some discordance that's where imaging may help before you go straight to a cath. The other thing I think we get too hung up on is whether <clears throat> uh, patients reach 85% of their maximum predicted heart rate. I don't think it really matters what, how far they go. You can still assess to see if the patient has angina on a treadmill, and you can still get a Duke treadmill score for risk. And not all patients need a Bruce treadmill uh, um, protocol. You can actually lower the treadmill incline or lower the speed through modified Bruce protocols or not in protocols, or you can just manually come down and hit the incline down or the speed down. And we, can, and we probably should be doing some more recumbent bikes for those that really can't walk. The other thing a treadmill does, which is very important, is it gives us an assessment of their non-cardiac symptoms. Maybe they're so limited by their arthritis, their claudication, their COPD, their obesity, their deconditioning, that the twinges of chest pain that the patient have rarely may not be the biggest problem to this patient. And further workup isn't going to change this because of their limitations in these other areas. The other thing about treadmill test is it's something that we should have available to everybody. It's, it's available in almost all of our cardiology offices. And as you talk about cost, as we move into value and talk more and more about value, the cost of a treadmill is much lower than the other modalities we'll hear, in particular, some of our nuclear stress testing options that we'll talk about. In final, I just would like to end with a quote from the recently published Orbiter trial that's gotten a lot of uh, publicity. And the authors, I thought, had a nice uh, uh, quote in their discussion where they said, clinicians have hoped that there might be the simple in entity named ischemia, which manifests as a positive stress test in clinical symptoms and that treatment by PCI or revascularization would limit the, eliminate these manifestations concordantly. Perhaps this notion is too optimistic. I think we've oversimplified. We've found patients who have symptoms who could be angina. We do a, an assessment of ischemia, and we assume that the ischemia explains why the patient had the symptoms, because that's why we ordered the test. The problem is, is that's not always the case, and it is overly simplified. And we probably need to have more objective evaluation of their symptoms
with treadmill testing. So in conclusion, I would say exercise treadmill testing should be our preferred initial test of choice. It defines the symptoms that we're trying to treat. It gives us mortality risk stratification. You can then do further testing after this treadmill if there's ambiguity in their symptoms, in their ischemia, or their risk. And this is something I think we should be available in some way or form for every primary care and cardiology office. And if we really wanted to hit true quality, trying to do these the same day the patients come in. So with that, we'll turn it over to uh, Jeff Bear, who's going to talk a little bit about um, exercise echo. All right. Thank you, Michael. That was great. Uh, it's almost as if we planned it, because you talked about all the things that I didn't. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk about stress echo. And I guess let me let's see which one is this. Here it is. Yeah. All right. So um, I think this is um, a nice um, kind of progression of tests. They start simple, uh, relatively less expensive, and then kind of progress to the more complex ones. And so I want to start just with a case. Um, and this is a very typical case I think a lot of people see. A uh, 56-year-old man comes in with some shortness of breath uh, for the last three months. Also mentions some maybe left-sided chest pressure. Uh, and this kind of gets to what Michael's talking about. People say chest pain, chest pressure, the sensation. You never quite know what they're talking about. And sometimes people just immediately assume that that's angina and ischemia, but it could be a lot of things. But anyway, all these symptoms have been going on for the last three months. He has a history of hypertension and diabetes. And when you look at his uh, physical exam, he is hypertensive, he's obese, has a little bit of a murmur, some lower extremity edema, and is on some medications uh, for his blood pressure, and he's got a you know, mildly abnormal EKG. So I would submit that we see a lot of these kind of patients, right? They don't just come in with one thing, they come in with a lot of different things, and their symptoms are somewhat vague, and you're not really sure exactly where to go with it. And so when you see these kind of patients in clinic, you have to ask yourself, you know, what, what, what tests am I going to order to try to evaluate these things? And I think the differential diagnosis in this situation is huge. Um, you can have all kinds of things from angina, obviously, to valvular heart disease, to uh, pulmonary hypertension, cardiomyopathies, heart failure, both diastolic and systolic. Obviously, a lot of non-cardiac etiologies, uh, COPD, pericardial disease, and just deconditioning. So I think the truth is, and this is kind of what Michael was talking about, when people come in with chest pressure or shortness of breath, we always kind of think, oh, is it, is it a blockage or not? But there's a million things that it could probably be. And sometimes you have to think about that when you order these tests, because it, some of the tests are very good for specifically ischemia, and others are more kind of a broader evaluation of the patient. So what can you get with a stress echo? Now, I will admit that this doesn't always happen in all echo labs. But you certainly can ask for some of these information when you order the test. You can say, hey, could you also get a pulmonary pressure? Could you also evaluate some other things along with the stress echo? But you certainly could get pulmonary pressures. You will definitely get some evaluation of valvular structure and function. You will definitely get an evaluation of systolic function. You can maybe see the pericardial. You can see if it's really thickened or not. That might be helpful for, um, for some pericardial processes. Filling pressures is a little bit more complicated. You have to ask specifically for some diastolic evaluation. Um, but you can certainly get those, and so if you're if you're if you're looking for a, if you're really not sure where this is going, you can add an additional information when you order these tests to get at least some of these, or, or in fact all of them. And I would when I when I think about a stress echo, I actually don't think about it so much as a stress a stress echo, but really an overall cardiac evaluation. You get a ton of information when you get a stress echo. You not only get the the ETT portion that Michael was talking about but you get all those other things that go along with an echocardiogram. So you can evaluate multiple different possible etiologies to the patient's symptoms with one test. And that's why I really uh, tend to go with that as my, my, my main um, uh, stress test modality. So you know, we had to throw up these obligatory sensitivity and specificity um, and numbers. Stress echo, when you look at it, is, is, is pretty decent. Uh, there's no doubt that um, SPECT and cardiac PET is a more sensitive test. Um, the specificity of SPECT is, is less um, than, than uh, cardiac PET. But these are all decent. I mean, they're not terrible tests. Uh, and I would say that if you have somebody who's extremely high risk that you're really worried about, sure, you can go the nuclear stress testing route. But for your intermediate uh, uh, pretest probability patients, I think stress echo is a nice blend between ETT, um, which has uh, somewhat lower sensitivity, and the, the more expensive and complex tests like the nuclear stress testing. Uh, 
And so really, I think you have to ask yourself, as you guys all know, probably what is the pretest probability when you think about which test to order. And I would say that with stress echo, you tend to be in this kind of intermediate risk group. Uh, it's true from a high risk patients uh, with already known coronary disease with a lot of wall motion abnormalities, I probably wouldn't be doing it. And for the low risk uh, patients, I completely agree with Michael that ETT makes a lot of sense. But I think for those ones, they're kind of in the middle, they have a lot of different squirrely symptoms, you're not exactly sure what's causing it. I think stress echo uh, makes a lot of sense. So uh, this was a paper published by one of our former colleagues about exposure to low-dose ionizing radiation from medical imaging procedures, and this got a lot of press several years ago, and is, I think, was one of the, one of the papers that really shifted our focus to being worried about um, all the radiation that we're exposing our patients to. And uh, he did a nice evaluation of all the different modalities, and basically just showed that a huge percentage of radiation that's given to our patients is from myocardial perfusion imaging. Now, the numbers that he used in terms of millisieverts, um, we've gotten a lot better about that. Our tests now are much lower uh, doses, and we're very good here at Emory about trying to limit the amount of radiation that patients get. Um, we're very good at it with cardiac PET, and we've gotten better at it with cardiac SPECT. But the bottom line is you still get radiation with these tests. And uh, we'll do a lot of tests, uh, we'll get a lot of tests from outside physicians that get sent to us for oftentimes young women who have gotten nuclear stress testing. And I almost cringe whenever I see that because you're subjecting a, a young patient to radiation and a woman with obvious breast tissue that puts it into a whole new kind of category of worrying about radiation exposure. So I really try very hard to avoid those kind of tests in young patients and specifically young women. So when would stress echo not be appropriate? Um, as we talked about, very high pretest probability. I would be going more with a cardiac pet. Uh, low pretest probability, uh, I would agree with an exercise treadmill test. And then the patients who have low uh, LV function, I tend to steer away from stress echo because it's just hard to see if you already have a low EF, does it go from 20% to 25%? It's very hard to kind of tease that apart. And then definitely, if pe people already have regional wall motion abnormalities, I really try to stay away from that because wall motion is hard enough as it is. Deciding if something is mildly hypokinetic, does that go to very hypokinetic to akinetic? It's very hard to tease those things apart. And so for these kind of patients, I, I would agree that either stress MRI or nuclear perfusion would be the modality of choice. I think that's my last slide. Oh, yeah, one more. So lots of options uh, with treadmill testing, cardiac PET, uh, stress MRI, and cardiac spec. And I would say that stress echo is kind of a nice blend of a lot of these things. You get some functional evaluation on the treadmill. You also get structural evaluation with echo. And you get kind of a decent uh, sensitivity and specificity. So for my intermediate risk patients, especially women, younger patients, I'll oftentimes do a lot of stress echo, and I'll reserve some of the other higher-end tests for my older uh, higher pretest probability patients. And I think with that, I believe Doug is going to speak about uh, cardiac SPECT. Well, those good, good points have been brought out. And, and we go to the next one, stress testing. And this is what we've been all talking about, is trying to choose the right test. And I think the points have been made that we don't always use the same test as we go through these things. And this is what I want to look for. As we talked about here today, we've been talking about these stress modalities and talking about exercise electrocardiography, stress echocardiography, myocardial perfusion imaging, and magnetic resonance. All these are looking at function. They're not looking at anatomy. There's some other tests, and a particular one, CT scanning, can give you anatomical features, but most of these give you just functional tests, and I think that that's what we're trying to find out is what's the consequences of any obstruction that might be in these patients' have. So there are functional studies, and I think the thing to remember is you order a test like this, is more than just saying I'm picking out a myocardial perfusion imaging. That is, you have to decide and you don't usually decide this. It's usually dictated by the people doing the test, but such things as what's the stress going to be? Is it going to be exercise, graded exercise, you might see? Is it going to be massive vasodilatation? As you're trying to dilate these arteries to put stress on and see if they can deliver the blood flow they need to for that. And so you'd have diapyridomol that could be used, give you massive vasodilatation. You could have Lexascan, which is used as is adenosine blocker too, and is also 
very short lived half life. You can use adenosine itself, and then you also can use inotropic agents, dobutamine. So these are things that come up as we do these tests. You would not necessarily order it, it would be, but you might have a say in what your hospital is doing and what approach they're using on these particular subjects. And then the other thing is you have the tracer. If you're going to do myocardial perfusion, you're going to be using some type of isotope there, and you've got to decide what the tracer is that you can use. And you can make cases for every one of these, thallium-201, which has been around for a long time, technesium, and various different forms of technesium have been used for this. So if you're looking at cardiac stress testing, the one that I would take is the very best test, and I think that people generally would say that this is the best test. It has limitations, which have already been pointed out to you, but myocardial perfusion imaging would be the one that you'd look at. Now, that's not the end of the game. If you say, I'm going to do a myocardial perfusion imaging, you've got two choices. You've got the spec, and you've got PET. If you look at these, a big difference in them is primarily a difference in the tracer. But SPEC is a single photon emission computed tomography. PET is positron emission tomography. Both of them will take a subject and stress them one way, either vasodilatation or by inotropic agent or by graded exercise. And then they deliver them an isotope that has a tracer on it, and they do the imaging. And that's where you get your study. And then if I took it all the way down, I would say, OK, I, favor myocardial perfusion imaging as a general test, and I certainly accept what has been said otherwise about times that you order these tests, and I'll go get back to that later. But then I would say myocardial perfusion imaging and the one I'd prefer would be a PET scan. And this is what we're talking about. As you look at this on a PET scan, as you can see that, that you have uh, here a black area is talking about an area that has no uptake, and it shows there there'd just be a big gap there. You have other areas that might have limited or decreased uptake, and they are not as bright as you might see in the others. And so this is what we're talking about, is looking at this and looking at the perfusion that has been delivered to these areas. All of these tracings will have an EKG of them, but when it comes down to the end and you're comparing the EKG and you're comparing the myocardial perfusion imaging, the myocardial perfusion imaging is going to weigh out, went out. And this is the total picture that you might see with one of these, as you would see that you have various images of the heart taken from different angles. You'd also have what we call a bullseye, which is like taking a collapsible cup and cut, pushing it all together. And that's why you get this, which come, is derived from these other single plane images. And then, as I said, you have the EKG accompanying. So why do I say that I prefer that we have myocardial imaging and I talk about the PET scan. Well, basically, it's better physics. If you look at it, there's things that come out. First is that it reduces the scatter of photons. So you have less extravasation of, of the photons out there. You have greater spatial re resolution. As you can look at it and you can assess the borders between the ischemic area and non-ischemic areas better than in this. You have lower radiation exposure, and this has been talked about that, but it was clearly PET has less radiation exposure than the SPEC does. And then the newest thing with PET is that you can measure maximum cardiac blood flow, which is something you couldn't do in the past. So these are the reasons I would do it. If I tried to stack them up and put them on a, a board here and said which comes out, you can see the SPEC offers us it's more widely available. If you go and look for a PET at a lot of hospitals, most of them probably will not have it, and I'll tell you why. Though. But this spec is cheaper. It ha half life of the tracer is longer, so you get a little more radiation there. You have a little longer time to work, but you're also getting more radiation. And then you have established reimbursement, and that's a problem that we'll talk about with a pet, is you can run into trouble of trying to get it reimbursed, less so with spec. You look at the pet, and the reason you would favor that, the reason the board tilts in the favor of the pet, is you do have better resolution of your images. You have shorter acquisition time. You have greater interpreter certainty. That is, that there's more reliability, more predictability of the people reading it, that their reading is going to be the same as their colleagues. And you have lower patient dosimetry, lower isotopes given to them. Big reason that you don't have PET available in a lot of places is look at the gamma camera, what it costs, 
and look at the scanner that it costs comparing the two. The gamma camera you would use with spec, the scanner you'd be using with PET. And also as you look at the quality and having people grade the quality of the images, they come out generally in favor of the PET scan. The thing we've talked about and Jeffrey talked about and I agree with is you look at this and you look at sensitivity and specificity and I've got a series of these. They're all different institutions looking at it. They generally all come out where the best quality is with a uh, PET. This next one, it summarizes again the sensitivity and all, is the first of these graphs that point out to the big problem. And this is the big problem when you start looking at PET is the cost. And you can look out here in the last two columns and you can see the technical plus professional fees that various institutions give and, and see the, the difference. And none of these make it where it didn't seem to be a lot of difference between the spec and the PET. But if you look at, say you look at Emory and you take a multi, multiple spec camera, it's going to be about $6,700 uh, that the spec would cost. And then you'd run up and have $8,900 for a pet. So you've got about a thousand dollar difference. Now also you can go back and look at Medicare and remember Medicare can get different rates because you contract with them and the difference in a Medicare here in the Emory system between spec and pet is only two hundred and sixty dollars. So that's that's the with our physicians working with CMS and trying to get some reduction in this that, that you can make some inroads in trying to reduce the cost but again the cost and the radiation are the two things that bother you most about this particular thing. Who knows who this is? Anybody know who this is? Thomas Keyes. Thomas Keyes was a theologian and a mathematician in England, and you can see there in about the 1700s. That said Keyes, Bayes, excuse me, Thomas Bayes. And what it is, is Bayes was the one that came up with a concept of using pre-test predictability to reduce what you'll have post-test. And it's coming back to a little of what Jeffrey was talking about, is that you take these tests and you bank on them. I would not try to sell anybody that myocardial imaging is the best test for everybody. That you need to look at the pre-test probability, how much disease they already known to have, do they have diabetes, do they have changes in electrocardiogram and you use that information to enhance your ability to read these films and you and it, use that information to decide which one of these tests you pick out. This is just a look at his the way he would do it and you would look and see is whether people have negative ST segments, people have positive ST segments, clearly their likelihood of having disease is going. So what you're doing is you're looking at this and trying to say that here you start out, patient has almost no chance of having disease, and you're going to very likely have a negative exercise test. Here you got somebody that's got his 45-year-old male that has no risk factors. He has very low possibility, but you come up here to a 45-year-old male with a clear-cut chest pain, his likelihood of having disease is much greater. So that's the thing we'd stress as we look at all these, and I think we all agree, is there's not one test for everybody that you need to think about what the patient is bringing to the table and you need to, to look at that. So the things that I would look at, as I said, is you do one of these tests, you want to be sure you have adequate stress. And one thing I think that I've seen happen, and I'm not sure, it's, well, I know it's not the right thing, is too often now stress tests are being done by somebody that doesn't even know the physician, I mean know the patient. That if, you, if I order a stress test on one of my patients, I've got some information as one is persuading me to order the stress test, but I might have a change. I might say if somebody that I know about that has what I think is truly angina and they exercise for three minutes and they start having some ST changes and getting a little discomfort, I'm ready to stop. I don't have to look and say you've got to reach 85% of your target rate. So I think that as, we, as you order a stress test, Talk to the person who's going to be doing it. Tell them what your suspicions are and let them use that to help. So these are the things that you need adequate stress, graded exercise, dobutamine. Like if you give them dobutamine and you're not reaching the heart rate, they can give them atropine to drive their heart rate up higher. Another thing that's been happening now with the changing our stress test is it used to do, as you recall some of the older physicians, you'd have a stress test ordered 
that was myocardial perfusion, and you'd have it done one day, and then you'd have it repeated the next day. One day is exertion, one day is rest. Now they're trying to get by that, either if they think it's a low test probability, they will start out and just do a resting scan, and if resting is normal, or they'll do an exercise scan, excuse me, if exercise test is positive, then they'll, they've stopped there. The other time is they can come in and give them a single bolus of the tracer initially for the rest, and then they'll come back and give them three times that tracer to, with exercise, and that way they can get the test done in a few hours rather than a couple of days. Single phase is what that's calling about, and that will reduce the cost. Another thing I think is when you go to a hospital, you're not at Emory Systems, you need to find out what the local expertise is. Some people are very good at reading echo cardiography and are very comfortable with that. Other people, that's not their bag. And you need to know that and, and don't be ordering tests at somebody that you don't have a local expert with and pick it out. And then the throughput is important and that's the way you reduce the cost on some of these tests is trying to increase the rate of which the test is done. This is an example, and we'll end with this, is this is an example, and you have, as you look, on this side is you're looking at a technesium and you're looking at a speck, here you're looking at PET. And you can look at it and try to read it and see what you think about this. The patient was a woman, she was 50 years old, slender, rather athletic, it had some sharp pain, was not typical coronary disease, and she came out, and I think most people would read this as normal, PET scan. People would come up and start saying, well, I'm worried about this area on this spec, if you did the spec. What she had had, it had breast implants, and this is attenuation due to the breast shadows, and if you did, if you weren't careful, you'd take this test and say it's positive, and I'm going to take her to the cath lab, or I'm going to do a PET because I'm not sure of it. And people that are in favor of the PET would come out and say, well, this is this one, it points towards the, the wisdom of using PET. I think if you read the literature, at least I read it too, and Stam, some of you might disagree with me that, is we're moving toward doing more and more PET. And I'm not saying, but at the same time, I say, remember, what you're working with and choose your, calf, uh, choose your patient or choose a test for your patient based on the pretest probability. So I'll leave it now to stand. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. I will try to open here. I will uh, talk about MRI. Stress MRI, basically. So, <clears throat> I'm sure that all of you are familiar with the ischemic cascade because all the imaging modalities that we use are based uh, on this cascade. And uh, depending on which uh, part of the curve you are, that's what uh, uh, the test will show you. And as you can see, before you have uh, you have perfusion abnormality first, then diastolic dysfunction, then wall motion abnormalities, and then the ischemic EKG changes and the agina if it happens. So basically, all these imaging modalities they work on the more subclinical aspects of the ischemic cascade, and uh, the echo uh, looks at the wall motion abnormalities, and uh, what Dr. Morris spoke about spec, pet about perfusion abnormalities. And uh, MRI is able to do, um, actually evaluate both, depending on, of course, what agent you use. And uh, for these modalities, for the uh, nuclear modalities, and for MRI, you can use a vasodilator, which basically gives uh, perfusion defects due to induced uh, flow heterogeneity. And uh, MRI can do that. We use uh, adenosine for that purpose in the, for the MRI procedures. And also, you can use the butamine uh, to induce ischemia and basically looking at wall motion abnormalities. In Emory Hospital and in the Emory system, and in the most of actually places uh, in the States and, uh, and abroad, they use uh, vasodilator for uh, uh, 
for perfusion imaging with MRI. And uh, there's an extensive uh, protocol. It takes about 40 minutes to do. And I don't want to go for uh, the interest of time, but uh, besides low ischemia that uh, we do with the, the giving the adenosine, we'll also can evaluate many things. And I will show you, including the LV and RV function that we actually can measure and get uh, actual uh, numbers. We can measure flows through the aorta and through the pulmonary artery. And also we can do assess viability. We can see if the patient had an infarct, how severe was the infarct and stuff like that. So this is uh, on the top right, you see a uh, scene image of the ventricle, short axis view, and you can appreciate how good are the images. On the middle image is after you give gadolinium, it's the contrast that we use. You can see the myocardium lighting up uh, through to normal perfusion. In the bottom light, uh, right, if you can see, uh, you can appreciate the, uh, the heart, the LV myocardium looks completely black after the contrast is given in, and that means that the whole myocardium is viable. Uh, this is a normal MRI, and I don't know if you can project it, if you can see well, but uh, you can see the contrast uh, coming in. We use usually three or four slices, three slices in the short axis, from the base to your left up to the uh, apex of the heart, and you can see the contrast comes in, uh, and you image, um, and you can see the contrast comes in the myocardium, and immediately, if it's normal, uh, occupies the whole myocardium. And again, as uh, Dr. Morris say, you have to have experience to, uh, to read these studies. This is uh, an abnormal study. And uh, just to show you, and I don't know how good you can see, but you can appreciate again from the base of the heart to the apex, you can see that rim on the anterior wall. The anterior wall is the top. Um, it's up here. Is the anterior wall on the top. You can see after the contrast comes in, uh, now it's all black, you can appreciate the rim of uh, the endocardium that doesn't get, that the contrast cannot go in because of the significant coronary disease. This patient had a tight LAD disease. So um, with experience, you can uh, be able to, to, to read these studies. And again, we are talking about intermediate risk patients because that's where I think all the modalities uh, that we talk today uh, supposed to be used. Again, with MRI, you can get the uh, fantastic images of the LV and RV, and actually you can measure the ejection fraction on these patients. You get a measured ejection fraction, which is very important. Also, you get a volumetric measurements uh, on these patients. And just to show you some images, you can see that the heart is how good is squeezing, and you think that the heart is normal. But if you do the delayed enhancement imaging that we do with the stress MRI, you can appreciate these whites of endocardial infarct. So, if sometimes you think that the EF is normal, the walls are moving great, and uh, you think it's normal, but the uh, MRI, because of the very high special resolution, can show you that the patient actually has an inferior myocardial infarction. Also, as I told you, you can get viability. This is uh, the ventricle, one of the views, uh, it's a five-chamber view. You can see the, the wall doesn't move. Is this dead or alive? With the contrast, part of the, uh, it's actually the last part of the MRI study, Whatever is white, that means that the contrast can, goes in but cannot get out because of the microvascular disease. And this tells you that uh, actually it's a big transmural myocardial infarction. Also, what uh, today with the advancement of technology, some patients will have some young patients. And uh, you want to rule out uh, malignant uh, coronary uh, anatomy. And as you can see here with the coronary MRA, you can see the ostia and make sure that the ostia of the coronary arteries come from the right uh, part of the aorta, and you can rule out abnormal coronary anatomy that can be lethal. Also, some people say that the MRI is black and white, but today we have color. And as you can appreciate, you can do tissue characterization, and you can uh, see if there's edema, if there's scar, with different measurements. So I think uh, uh, a lot of advancement in this field, but just people don't know uh, much about it because uh, uh, it's a technology that has developed in the last uh, few years. And as the, um, uh, Dr. Bayer talked about, very important, uh, we have to be very conscious about the radiation. And as you can see in this study, it's actually from the same study that Dr. Bayer showed you. Look at this. For men, not a big problem if they get some extra radiation doses from a nuclear stress test or other mortalities. But look at the woman, 40-year-old woman, you know, if you get even one scan, look at the risk for uh, developing 
that uh, sometime in your life, cancer, huge. So always be cognizant about women. When we do stress test, consider all stress echo or uh, cardiac MRI uh, to, to see what the patient has, you know, and we do more and more, even low risk. We send patients for, with low risk for uh, SPECT or PET, which I think is, uh, is, very, is very bad, knowing what we know and also knowing that there's other modalities that we can use in these patients. And MRI can give you prognostic information. Again, if you have a negative MRI, the possibility of having an event in the next year, two years, is very, very low, almost zero, and of course very high if the MRI is positive. We have done this study before here a few years back here from CDU, and uh, we found exactly great results. Patients with negative MRI had uh, almost 100% negative prognostic value, and this is reproduced very high negative prognostic value in other studies. And the study that is very recent and compares SPECT and MRI for males and females, as you can see, the red line is the SPECT, and the blue line is the, uh, is the MRI, stress MRI. You can see that the MRI uh, is better compared to SPECT for males and for women. And as you can see, the difference between uh, on SPECT between men and women, is, it does very less SPECT on women because of a small heart and also problems with uh, uh, resolution on the SPECT images. So MRI is, uh, I think, is a better test if it's done in good hands, but uh, definitely not inferior to SPECT uh, or other nuclear modalities. The problem is some artifacts, and also the problem compared to the SPECT and PET is that we can still not quantify the perfusion defect uh, very accurately and on timely matter. I think that's the main limitation of uh, cardiac MRI for stress evaluation. So why you should order MRI for stress is well validated, highly accurate, rapid, non-invasive, no radiation, very high special resolution, better than any other modality. Better, even is uh, much, much better than, uh, than PET. You have bonus data, LV and RVEF, volumes and viability, and we have uh, diagnostic and prognostic information. So because I, I was the last uh, to talk, I want to give you some tips uh, for the stress testing uh, for you guys. So I think as Dr. Morris say, the test is as good as the reader who does the interpretation. So if you have no, all these are very high tech, uh, uh, modalities, and I think, uh, you know, if you read many of those, I uh, think uh, you have to have a reader that knows how to read it and to interpret the test. Always prefer exercise if the patient can exercise instead of pharmacologic. So exercise uh, with a Duke score that uh, uh, Dr. McDaniel talked about is very important because uh, if you have, uh, like, uh, you exercise somebody for 10, 11, 12 minutes, even if he has a small defect, you know that this patient has good prognosis. Uh, so always try to include, to do the imaging with a stress uh, test. Young patients, especially women, as I said, be mindful of radiation. Choose cardiac MRI for stress or echo. Exercise echo preferably, or the patient can exercise DSC instead of SPECT or PET. And for high BMI patients, think about PET uh, because of the speci better special resolution uh, compared to SPECT. Happy holiday season, and thank you very much. So, I want to congratulate our four speakers for keeping us well on time. We have plenty of time for, for questions and discussion. But uh, for, for, for selecting, you know, you still have to check the box on the order sheet whether you're going to do exercise or pharmacologic stress and uh, I think as to reiterate what Stan just just pointed out I mean we I get the we hear oh let's order we'll order pharmacologic because this patient will never reach their heart rate but as Mike pointed out um, you know you don't have to achieve target heart rate to, to learn what you need to learn about the patient depending on the question you're answering so I think we need to get creative I think we should and I've done this you you, you order you can order actually spec with with exercise but have have it provisional and that provisional lexus scan you basically have the patient walk and if they don't reach an endpoint of angina or st depression and haven't reached the heart rate that you kind of want them 
then you provisionally uh, inject the, 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 the Lexus scan, and you really learn you learn more about you learn a lot from the exercise test. Then you get the benefits of the pharmacologic stress. In addition, the patient doesn't usually suffer the side effects as much of the uh, pharmacologic tracer when they're actually walking. So, combining these protocols is, to, is, is I think, very important. Um, so that will. One quick comment about the pretest probability. I think one useful um, kind of uh, way to approach it is you have to ask yourself if the test comes back negative, are you going to believe it? So if somebody has chest pain and you say, well, if the stress echo or the ETT comes back negative, am I going to believe it? And if the answer to that is no, then then you're going to have to do some other kind of test. So sometimes that's the way I think about it. I'm trying to figure out which test to do. Um, and sometimes the answer is, well, I don't believe any of those tests, in which case that leads to a coronary angiogram. But sometimes between an ETT, you might say, well, I'm really kind of worried about this patient, and I really would believe a PET, but I wouldn't believe an ETT. And that kind of can help guide you in terms of which test to order and help you look at how you assess pretest probability. Because it's not always, well, we talk about it, but it's kind of hard to conceptualize how you, you answer that question. So. Hello? All right. Very informative uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Just want to understand a little bit more about the cost and um, logistical uh, uh, issues with uh, cardiac uh, MRI stress tests. Is it very, exp how does it co uh, cost compared to the other types? And is it uh, time consuming relative to the other types as well? Um, yeah, actually, the cost by Medicare that uh, Dr. Morris provided to me is uh, it's like $800, the whole fee, you know? I mean, Hospital charges, of course, much more, but uh, what they pay is about, uh, I think, $800, $800 both the professional and technical fee. Regarding the time for the MRI, you know, if uh, you are in a place like here and uh, Midtown that they do a lot, you know, it's like 40 minutes to do. So it's not the max. Uh, I mean, the other modalities, again, stress echo, it will take uh, about the same time, nuclear will take, so it's not uh, an extraordinary time, like 40 minutes. So I think the biggest issue we have as an outpatient is cardiac PET. Um, with Medicare, it's not a problem, uh, but with the private insurances, it is. And so the big cutoff for that is usually your patients with a BMI above 40. Almost all the insurance companies will approve a PET. When it's below that, then it becomes problematic. Um, but that's the biggest area. Now, if it's an inpatient, you can order whatever you want in terms of it, you know, there's no issue with pre-certification, but it's the outpatient cardiac PETs that are the really tricky ones.
any other, any other questions? We can. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.